eastern Himalayas, nurturing an ancient region, an intermingling of traditions and faiths. It's one of India's lesser known regions, unexplored, remote and exotic for most. But times are changing. As a filmmaker, I have always wanted to explore the northeast of India. I'm here on a journey of discovery and exploration through India's misty mountains. I'm driving to a very special place today, the first organic seed production and seed bank in Northeast India. Supporting small scale and marginal farmers to reconnect with their ancient agricultural practices. Tucked between the mountains of Arunachal and Brahmaputra in Assam, Pabhoi is a small village. Here, a group of dedicated people have come together to safeguard the indigenous seed of the area and successfully growing more than 100 varieties of rice. Right now, food security is facing us straight in the face. And there are new varieties coming in, which are not immune. And therefore, it's really heartening to see that you're protecting about 100 varieties, different rice crops that can withstand. They have been tested and proven for thousands of years. They're our farmer's intellectual property. Correct. How are they coping with the changing weather climate? Yes, uh, they do adapt much better than the ones that are being if I compare them with those, the new seeds that the big multinations are developing, you know, of F1 varieties and CMS, uh, it's uncomparable, you know. They have more resistance, they are more sustainable, and they're the ones which I believe is the next thing that we have to focus on, or else we'll lose our self-dependency on, on everything, you know. How many people come here, for example? How many farmers come here? So last year we had around 6,000 farmers all across Northeast to come and see what we do what, and they come and learn and they try to replicate it, you know. These are farmers from all over the country, different parts of yes, the... Yes, yes. Most of it's all the seven states. We also have farmers from Bhutan, we also have farmers from uh, Urissa, we have farmers from West Bengal and many other parts, you know. So we have regular workshop. We also trained farmers, which like last year, 50% of the farmers who came to our farm are being trained free. That is what is required to keep mm. the gene pool intact. Because the farmer will keep nurturing it. And you know, we will not be blackmailed by this uh, intrusion of GM seeds and other crops, which have no resistance. But I've seen here, in this plot itself, the experimentation that you're taking place. So are you developing any further drought resistant or water resistant varieties? Yes, hybridization occurs with the same breeds that we had, but we, we doesn't focus on that because there is no money on that, you know. So we are trying to see that the resistance of few particular traits or the lines or the crops or the varieties which can resist too much of rain, which can resist too much of drought. And we are trying to mass propagate those year after year and do the selection. Mm -hmm. And then we come out with varieties which are really adaptable to our change of climate. Another thing is, I'd like to clear my mind about mm -hmm. <laughs> Really, I saw some cauliflowers so huge, mm -hmm. but tomatoes so large. Mm -hmm. So are these organic or? Yes, they're organic and they're heirloom, you know. These are passed on through generations because these seeds can be replicated by each and every farmers. General knowledge of LSA is that yes. organic is always short and stunted and looks ugly. But here I saw such delicious uh, examples of tomatoes, 700 grams. And you say it's absolutely organic. Yeah, there is a big propaganda by big companies only to, you know, like 
So, I you mean, run it down. Yes, to suppress it, or else you know, every everyone would have their own seats, own rights, own sovereignty. You know, here in this island of hope, in Assam, I'm very happy to see so many varieties and so many people working, especially the farmers coming in, learning and taking back a piece of knowledge with them. For the last couple of years, we had been, you know, propagating or you know, safeguarding the seeds. But now we thought that we also need to have a commercial aspect, so we have started, you know, selling our seeds because there should be a viable, sustainable alternative. We speak about hybrid seeds, but when we train people, they always say that no, we don't have the seeds now. We are bound to buy those seeds, and this is doesn't only. This is just a entry point for the seeds, you know, because seeds brings two other things. First, they will bring fertilizers and then they will bring chemicals. Because okay. those varieties are not our varieties. They're not adaptable to this climate. In this area where I see a lot of activity happening, mm. what are the things that you're doing? And so we have uh, multiple activities because everything are interrelated, you know? So the first thing is that we have cows. Yes. So the sheet of the cows are being transformed into manure or with the help of worms, we do vermicompost manure. Then the cow urine is used for making biopesticides. It's also written in the Vedas and all. Initially, I thought it's very superstitious, yeah. but once I tried it, you know, I got the result, you know. Because well, there's the yeah. proof. I always thought, I mean, these are just words written. But no, 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 because cow urine doesn't kill the insects so that they doesn't build up the immunity. They just throw them out. We have uh, rice, where we are also maintaining 108 varieties of rice. 108 and varieties of rice. We have more than 250 varieties of heirloom vegetables with us. We also have some honeybees. It also helps in pollination and it also keeps the environment. Yeah, they are flagship like pollinators. Exactly, they are. And, and bees are under threat today. And very much. So we have a new model of doing uh, our marketing of vegetables and of farm produce where we have a big set of customers in the cities nearby like in Tejpur and Guwahati and every Saturday night we send it by overnight buses and morning they collect it and then they put the money in the bank. Oh lovely. Yeah, so we have direct uh, consumer and producer uh, link up and there is no middleman. Such. So while protecting the environment hmm. and the natural resources you are empowering village communities and making life yes. sustainable. Is there a future dream that you have? <laughs> what would you like to see happening around you? So I think in the front of sustainability, we hardly put any stress on the holistic uh, approaches. So we want to create a sustainable model where it's replicable, you know. It's very yeah. good to say the farmers do organic, but we don't have a solution for that. So we want to create that kind of a system, you know. Mm -hmm. And once the system is created, it works within itself. Sustainability is a word which is so over misused. Everyone talks about sustainability. Yes, yes. So it's not magic. You mm -hmm. have to have ground level changes. Mm -hmm. We have developed to three clusters now. So one is a village called Thambang. It's a heritage village in the western part of Ornachal. And we are trying to create seed villages. And oh. one is in Khonoma in Nagaland and one is in Basta district in Assam. Our main intention is to create those sustainable villages, you know, so that they become less dependent on the outside world. They still have those, you know, like indigenous knowledge, they have the indigenous seeds and everything intact. For us, our main vision is to create those villages. In my lifetime, if I'm able to create only two villages which are sustainable, that's enough for me. It's not only the, you know, like innovations or inventions that will work out. We also have to focus on the wisdom, the tradition and knowledge, the age-old farmers, you know, like experience, which really matters, you know, which, which can only pave the way out. At an age when everything around us is in trouble, everything is struggling to survive. Efforts like these are glimmers of hope. Hope that the youth of the nation has the ability to reverse and restore the damage, building solutions, creating a groundswell that will strengthen the future.
a UNESCO World Heritage Site, Manus National Park is one of the most biodiverse areas in the country. Grasslands and tropical forests spread over 950 square kilometers. Manas stretches across the international boundary into Bhutan. The Manas River flows through the heart of the park, a lifeline for the wildlife and the people here. Once critically endangered and fragmented, today more than 300 frontline forest staff are responsible for the protection and conservation of the forests in Manas. It's such a pleasure for me to be here and Yes. Manas is a world heritage site. Yes, yes. It is one of the most beautiful places and that is why it is included in the world heritage site. And you just see, uh, within a few years, Manas was original form. So now we have got 40 rhinos which have translocated from Kaziranga and Pavitara. Mm -hmm. And okay. we have translocated the uh, swamp deer also. And we have got now 83 swamp deer. So now the population of tiger has also considerably increased. Now we have got 25 adult tiger and five as a cubs. So what I feel, within few years, the population of all the animals will be increased. Manas is a success story from a disturbed area yes. just a few years ago. Yes, yes. Everything has become okay. 44,000 tourists have come last year, and uh, this year we are expecting more than that. Even. Eco tourism really mm. has rooted in this area and is proving to be beneficial. We have got rafting facility, so many people are coming for rafting also. First of all, people can see how beautiful Manas is because it is nearest to the Bhutan and you probably know the Royal Monas is also a very good national park. It is a 1054 square kilometer which is contiguous to Manas National Park. Mm. So most of the animals it is going from this side to Bhutan side and it comes back. So yes, forests are their home so they, they don't have any geographical really. boundary. No visas. No visas. <laughs> is the biggest river in the It's very beautiful. You can see. Amazing. Yeah. The other side is Bhutan. That's Bhutan? Yes. Kelly Park. This river is coming from Bhutan. It is okay. so amazing to <laughs> see yes. this. Manas National Park is a classic example of an intact forest that has transformed over the past decade. Sustained conservation efforts and management has made the forest a revenue generator for the local communities, ensuring that both the people and the forest benefit each other in the long run. Gangtok has spawned a brand of innovative startups 
that are creating opportunities for the youth in Sikkim. Any taxi was set up to provide travellers with a reliable and responsible travel solution for the northeast region, enabling local employment in the growing travel industry. My name is Srivat Chetri and I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I run a travel company called Any Taxi, which deal with holiday taxi. The culture diversity of Northeast is very huge. And uh, if you just see Arunachal Pradesh, there are more than 40 tribes just in Arunachal Pradesh. And if you see entire Northeast, like we have more than, I think, two to 300 tribes. So in terms of that, we have a very hugely diverse culture. And at the same time, you see uh, environment and biodiversity. I think we are the hotspot in the entire world. Every person who communicates with me when I'm outside is uh, whether we are connected or not, whether it's safe to travel or not. That is a stereotype which I'm trying to break in uh, when I started Any Taxi to be accessible to anyone who is traveling to Northeast. So one thing is we ensure that whenever a traveler comes to book through us, we have created in terms of accessibility, in terms of when you come to a platform and when you try to book a cab. So we try to make it very much easy and accessible. And you can basically book uh, from a platform to entire Northeast. We are across eight states and you can book into each part. Yes, ma'am. So in case of North Sikkim, you are going to Darjeeling or Kalimpong, so that is there. The prices won't be reduced that much. We ensure that every traveller who is travelling with us feel comfortable and very much welcoming while we communicate and when they are on ground, uh, while they are around with our drivers. They are specially trained to do that. So in terms of uh, everything, wherever you go, it's pre-planned. Everything, wherever you are going, it's a tourist destination and it's hand-picked by our travel experts. We call ourselves a our holiday taxi expert. And so that is precisely defines who we are. Uh, Any Taxi as a company, we are trying to promote uh, green tourism, where uh, if you travel with us, there's an option where you can erase your carbon footprints. And giving you a, uh, a short stat is, when you use a Toyota Innova for an entire day, creates around 80 gauges of carbon, which can be erased by planting three trees and maintaining it for 10 years. So we are calculating and we are trying to compensate uh, any travel that happened through us. So that way we are also taking our company towards being a sustainable travel company. When I started my company, there were very few travelers traveling to Northeast, but they were traveling to Sikkim. If you see today's stats, so there are equal number of tourists traveling to each state as people are traveling to Sikkim. So I think the mentality towards Northeast has immensely changed. We are very much a hotspot, but not explored enough. My name is Paldin Tendur Sherpa. A passion come part-time business, I do uh, mountain biking and homestay services in Gantok. We started this venture in 2007. Hub Outdoor is the first uh, cycling-based company in the Sikkim and Darjeeling. Uh, especially, I can proudly say it is in the Northeast also. Northeast also, we are the first among to create the mountain biking company. When I'm riding the bike, it's like a free bird with a free mind. I feel it's like a retreat. Gantok is uh, one of the best places for me because it's a small town and surrounding, you see the radius of the Gantok is hardly around 15 kilometers. Even though, if I ride my bike, it's just say around uh, 20 minutes to get out from the town. And once you're out of the town, it's fantastic. It's all beautiful people, beautiful culture, and everything is there. So I think that why I love Gantok. Sikkim has the biggest potential in the terms of sustainable ecotourism and 
Adventure Tourism. In 2017, we received 14 lakh tourists in Sikkim and it indicates a very, very welcoming attitude from the Sikkimese people. At the same time, the infrastructures are also developing. The only concern is that it has to be planned very wisely so that the generations to come can also enjoy the same view. So we are planning to do the riding in nearby locations. Uh, let's pray the weather god and let's have a beautiful time on the trip. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, Kanchanzonga National Park, Sikkim's only national park. I've been on the road for many weeks now, and this feels like a good place to complete this incredible journey. When we have to speak about Kanchanzonga, it's not just the mountain, it is also the garden deity of Sikkim. So people worship Kanchanzonga. In 2016, the Kanchanzonga National Park, or Gochala Zongri Trek, was declared as one of the cleanest destinations. Rikstang is a tourism destination, you know. It's not a stopgap between your two places when you want to travel. So those who want to really understand what Sikkim is about, the authenticity of it, that kind of people that are, we are interested in catering to also. There's so less that is being said about us. If you want an integrated India, I think it's important to have the history. 